There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Would you please pray with me? Father, this morning we acknowledge the truth that came from the pen of your servant James, who said every good gift, every perfect thing is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation and no shifting shadow. And so, Father, this morning, as your children, we ask you for the gift of your word, working through the power of the Holy Spirit to change our lives. And we give you all the glory and thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we return to the convicting letter to the Romans, we return to part two of Paul's closing statements in heaven's decree against mankind. To sum it up, as we saw last week, all of mankind, both Jew and Gentile, male and female, young and old, are under sin. And as all are under sin, all are rightly, justly, and inescapably condemned by Almighty God who is holy, righteous, and true. Paul has said this in verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Regarding ethnic background, genealogical heritage, or family tree, no one has an advantage over anybody else. Why? Simply because sin has leveled the playing field. Sin, in a sense, is an equal opportunity employer. It has employed both Jew and Gentile, male and female, young and old, in its acts of treason and rebellion against the Lord. The result being that there is no excuse for all of mankind because all are engaged in the great labor of sin. Also, if you remember from last week, we took the time to split theological hairs so that we could highlight the implications of the phrase that the apostle uses here in verse 9. He did not say all are in sin, though that certainly is true and is the phrase that is used elsewhere in Scripture. But rather, here in Romans, being led by the Holy Spirit, Paul chose the words, all are under sin. In this, it was my argument that by using under instead of in, that God was trying to get our attention about the ugliness of the nature of sin. That sin is like being under a heavy burden or a difficult weight that we just can't get rid of. And furthermore, this difficult, heavy, inescapable burden is like a thief. It robs us. It takes our life. It steals our vitality. It runs off with our ambition. 
It pillages and plunders our soul, and ultimately it violently devastates and ruins our existence. Like a sinister thief waiting in a dark alley, it mugs the wayward traveler, stealing his possessions, wounding his soul, and leaving him to die in those wounds. Psalm 32 is helpful with this vivid image of the ugliness of sin. Psalm 32, 3 through 4 says, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Though my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah, pause, meditate on this very important truth. Sin is a vicious, violent thief that robs us of life, stealing our vitality just like the fever heat of summer. And sin is also pervasive. And what do we mean by pervasive? We mean that this ugly thief has infiltrated and infected and spread throughout the entire essence of man's existence. And as it has pervasively spread throughout the entire essence of man's existence, it has brought about the threefold condition of total depravity, total inability, and total condemnation. Sin has so polluted the being of a person that it has touched our heart, mind, emotions, will, and soul, producing an inability in the flesh to satisfy the demands of God's law and being totally powerless to change this situation. It results in the logical conclusion that before God, all are under condemnation. Why? Because all are under sin. This is the reality that the first three chapters of Romans has explained to us. Paul could have stopped there, with verse 9, right? And we would have probably understood. And in fact, he really could have stopped back in chapter 1, or he could have stopped in chapter 2. But in all of this, he persists. He doesn't merely make a simple, brief, to-the-point statement about man's condition under sin, but rather he presses, he pushes, he squeezes. And in this way, he is much like the prophets of the Old Testament in their charge of sin against Israel. When you read the prophets, they just keep squeezing and squeezing about man's sinful rebellion against the Lord. And so it's ironic that as Paul preaches in this very same style, that he turns to the prophetic voice of the Old Testament to make the indictment of heaven against sin airtight in this conclusion. So as we continue through our text this morning, Paul is going to give us the voice of Scripture saying, as it is written, and presenting us with three witnesses of man's sin. Then he will summarize the relationship between the law and sin in three doctrinal truths. And finally, we will conclude with a look toward Christ and toward hope. So that is our roadmap this morning, and if you'll allow me, I need to grab some water. I have some terrible dry mouth going on. I blame medications. <laughs> By the way, I was on 34 pills a day. I'm only on two now, so hey. <laughs> we will overcome in the name of the Lord. So as I said here, 
the apostle, functioning similarly to a prophet, proclaims the word of the Lord and does so by quoting from some key prophetic texts of the Old Testament. And uh, maybe just as a little bit of a side note, a little bit of a rabbit trail here by way of reminder, when we refer to something being prophetic or somebody operating as a prophet, what we mean by that is twofold. It means that it is prediction and that it is proclamation. Or we could use different words and we could say it is foretelling and it is forthtelling. This is what prophecy is. This is how prophets function. They were predictive and they were proclamation. The prophetic voice is not merely that of predicting the future, which is often what it is simplified to mean today, but it is also a proclamation in the sense of, thus saith the Lord. This is true. It is from the mouth of God. Listen up. Right? So when we're talking about biblical prophecy, we're not talking about some kind of fortune teller who reads the stars or reads the cards or reads the daily newspaper, for that matter, in order to tell us about the future. We are talking about one who is called, chosen, and empowered by the Lord to speak the authoritative word of the Lord, which often has a future effect. It is my opinion that today there are many who run around calling themselves prophets or anything but biblical prophets. They may give all kinds of predictions about the future, but when it comes to the word of God, they are completely barren and lacking in its truth and thus are disqualified according to scripture. And uh, so church, we must be wise and we must be shrewd just because somebody says, hey, I'm a prophet, <laughs> you need to test it. So at any way, a biblical prophet, biblical prophecy is that which is prediction and proclamation, foretelling and forthtelling. It is both. And it would be my assessment that Paul here is an apostolic example of this. So, in prophetic apostolic manner, he quotes a chain of Old Testament scriptures, and this chain of scriptures is the voice of a threefold witness against sin in the life of the sinner. If you're taking notes, this threefold witness is, first of all, a witness of sin in our thoughts, secondly, a witness of sin in our words, and thirdly, a witness of sin in our actions, and let me show you each of these just briefly as I take another swig of water. <laughs> First of all, from verses 10 through 12, Paul uses the voice of Scripture to show us its witness against our sinful thoughts. And he says this, Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. And so quoting here from the prophetic voice of David in Psalm 13, we are told that there are none righteous. And to emphasize this point, it says, not even one. So just in case a person is tempted to think that scripture here is speaking in generalities, all possible confusion is removed by these qualifying words of not even one. None are righteous, no, not even one. This is not a general blanket statement that maybe has loopholes in it. No, not even one. And furthermore, why does the voice of Scripture say this, that none are righteous? No, not even one. Because there is none who understands. None are righteous. 
because none understands. That in the thoughts and comprehension of mankind, there are none righteous because none rightly understands. And so the question then becomes, well, understands what exactly? And the answer is given in the next quote, which says, there is none who seeks for God. The singular point of argument is connected in the two words, understands and seeks. Obviously, we recognize the word understands to be a reference to thinking or our thoughts. But what may not be easily recognized is that the same thing, the same theme, is being used in the word seeks. So let me give you a brief explanation from the Greek language. The common Greek word translated into English as the word seek is the word zeteo. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The word seek in that verse is the Greek word zeteo, and just simply means to pursue. But the word seek given here in Romans 3.11 is a slight variation of that Greek word, which is ek zeteo. And it has a more specific meaning. It carries the sense of pursuing the knowledge of something. To seek something by learning about it. It isn't just to go after something in a general sense, zeteo. It is to go after something by learning about it, ek zeteo. To gain knowledge of it. And by learning and gaining knowledge of it, to apprehend it with the mind. And in this verse, what is the object of our learning pursuit? God. God. We are to seek God through the means of learning and gaining knowledge about Him. But notice the charge of the prophetic voice in that he says there are none who do this rightly, consistently, and with a pure, sincere heart. There are none who sincerely seeks for God in the sense of honestly learning about God in order to know God and in knowing God to rightly understand Him and His ways. Now, at first glance, this might seem like a crazy accusation. But I assure you, it is more common than you may think. Even among those who may claim Christ. I can remember not too long ago, a family in our church came to me with the complaint that all I do from the pulpit is teach the Bible, and they were so sick of it. They were mad, they were angry. All you ever do is instruct us about the Bible. You just quote Bible verses, Pastor. So tired of it. And as a result, they left the church. Broke my heart. So it happens. There is a pushback in our sinful nature against learning and knowing God. We don't like it in our flesh, in our fallen nature, in our sinful state. But just to be clear, because of verses like this and many others from Scripture that I could quote... I want you to know that as your pastor, I will not back down from my calling to teach this word. Why? Because this word gives us the knowledge of God. You're not going to get it anywhere else. The prophetic charge here against mankind is that in our unredeemed, unregenerate, sinful state, none understands God because none sincerely seeks to learn about God in order to know God. 
And as your pastor, I recognize that this is the charge of heaven against all of mankind. But if I have anything to do about it, it will not be the charge against gospel open Bible church. Instead, we will obey the command of Hosea 6 and reap its very good fruit. Hosea 6.3 says, so let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. So in Romans, the charge is made that in our thoughts, thinking, knowledge, there are none righteous because there are none who understands God. Why? Because there are none in their unregenerate state who rightly pursue the knowledge of God. And what does he say here is the result? All have turned aside. Together they have become useless, worthless. There is none who does good. And in that, he emphasizes again, there is not even one. A shocking result here is that man has become useless. In what sense? In the sense that our neglect of the knowledge of God has led to lawlessness, unrighteousness, and depravity of all kinds. And this makes us useless for any moral good. If we neglect to know God, then we essentially become worthless because the moral depravity which fills the void of that ignorance. Something's going to fill your mind. If it's not the word of God, if it's not the knowledge of the Lord, something's going to fill it. You can't just be idle in learning and in knowledge. God created us to be learning creatures. So what are you going to be learning about? The Lord or the ways of the world? So we begin to feel the prophetic force of the voice of Scripture and its witness against our thinking here in these first couple of verses. But then Paul moves on, and secondly, from verses 13 through 14, Paul quotes the Old Testament to show us its witness against our words. Oh, and this is always fun, isn't it? We love it when the pastor preaches about our words. (laughs) He says this, Romans 3.13, Their throat is an open grave, with their tongues they keep deceiving, The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So quoting again from the Psalms, once more Paul charges mankind with trespass. And from what angle does he approach it this time? From the angle of our words. I think it is safe to say that the most Convicting passages of Scripture are the ones with deal, that deal with our words. If you want to preach a sermon that will quickly, easily, and effectively bring the congregation under a sense of conviction, then preach a sermon about the tongue. For example, the convicting words of James would be a great place to start. James 3, verses 5 through 8. He says, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life. Oh, and this feels good. And is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one, says James, can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil 
and full of deadly poison. Can you be more descriptive, James? <laughs> and if that isn't enough for conviction, well, just keep reading in the next couple of verses, James 3, 9 through 10. He says, with it, with the tongue, with our words, we bless our Lord and Father, singing praises and hymns to the glory of his name. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the image of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. And James says, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. But yet they are, aren't they? If you ever want to humble a group of people before the Lord, then preach on the evil of the tongue. And in case you haven't caught on yet, this is exactly what Paul is doing. And he is humbling us to the point of submission before the Lord. So let's look at it. The apostles' description of the vehicles which carry our words is very vivid, very graphic. Brings us quickly to our knees in humble repentance. He says here, first of all, the throat is like an open grave. The imagery, get that image in your mind. Like an open pit in a graveyard. That the words from our throat are like a hazard which will lead to death. The tongue is a thing of constant deception, he says. It's like a machine on the assembly line of a factory. The tongue continually, incessantly produces the product of deception and duplicity and lies. Or he says again, under the lips waits the poison of snakes, like a venomous snake lying under cover, waiting for its prey, ready to strike. The lips lie in wait to inflict its poison, to destroy the next unsuspecting victim who crosses our path. And he says again, the mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Like drinking a giant glass of vinegar, the mouth is full of bitterness towards any who would swallow its curses. The imagery is vivid. The throat, the tongue, the lips, the mouth, all of them working together serve the purpose and the point of Paul that indeed there are none righteous. There are none who does good continually. No, there is not even one. And all you have to do is look at the words that comes out of our mouth. <laughs> and so we have the second witness from the prophetic voice of Scripture saying that because of sinful words, all are proven to be under sin. So this brings us to verses 15 through 18. And thirdly, Paul uses the voice of Scripture to show us its witness against our sinful actions. So we have our thoughts, we have our words... And now Paul is going to bring it to bear on our actions, as if we need any more evidence, right? But we will follow faithfully the word of God as it is spelled out for us. He says this, Romans 3, 15 through 18, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known, for there is no fear of God before their eyes. In his final set of Old Testament quotes, Paul speaks again from the Psalms as well as a quote from Isaiah for flavor and seasoning. Three things are mentioned here. That first of all, the feet of sinners are swift to shed blood, resulting in a path of destruction and misery. The sinful nature is easily seen in a person who is quick to withhold mercy quick to criticize, and even quicker to shed blood for their own gratification and even vengeance, whether it is justified or not. Overly critical, overly judgmental, and vindictive, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, 
do me dirty and I'll do dirty to you. No mercy, no grace, no forgiveness, only self-justification and vindication and vengeance without mercy. Swift to shed blood. Oh, that's a sign of our culture today, is it not? How easily people get upset at the grocery store. It blows my mind. I love the grocery store. I go there every day. (laughs) I intentionally forget things, so I have to go back later in the day. But it never fails. There's somebody who's mad. They got done wrong, and they want everybody to know about it. There's no mercy There's no forgiveness. I'm just going to be critical about everything. And I want vindication. And if I get the opportunity, I'll take it. To the point of shedding blood, says Paul. Well, secondly, as a result of this, Romans says the path of peace is unknown. Living a life of continual violence, vengeance, and ruthless behavior, producing misery for others, will cause peace to remain hidden. Surprise, surprise. It is no surprise that in a culture like ours, which celebrates revenge, vindication, and ruthless behavior through movies, sports, and video games, that we have no peace in our culture. Right, I'm not coming against movies or sports or video games per se. Have fun. But guard your heart. Because in that is a lot of celebration of what I'm talking about right here. We're going to get even. We're going to get back. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And we're going to call it entertainment. Well, Paul says it's no surprise for those people that there's no peace. It's a simple math of Scripture. Paul's going to say a lot more about this in chapter 12. So for now, we'll just recognize that our sinful nature is identified in actions that are swift to shed blood, resulting in the absence of peace. All of this to prove the point that all are under sin, none are righteous, no, not even one. Which brings us to our third and final point here, which is the worst charge of all against the works of man. The voice of scripture says here that there is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no ability to even see the fear of God. The unregenerate sinner has been blinded from seeing the Lord rightly. The fear of the Lord, I don't know. I can't see it. And as a result, there is no fear of the Lord to govern wise choices for life. It isn't just like, well, the fear of the Lord, take it or leave it, without any kind of consequences. No, the consequence is exactly this, that if there is no fear of the Lord, then there is no wisdom, because that's where wisdom begins. Read Proverbs, read Ecclesiastes, read any of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. If there is no fear of the Lord, which means there is no godly wisdom... And the result is the ability, is is a loss of the ability to choose between what is right or what is wrong. And our actions reflect that. Paul says, they have no fear of the Lord. This is the inspiration for their evil acts. And so, as I said, I think this is probably the worst charge of all because it really just kind of becomes the source of all kinds of evil, right? 
we'll let that one go for a while too. We'll come back to it later in uh, chapter 12 too, I think. So. so Paul, with the prophetic voice of Scripture, concludes this chain of Old Testament verses. He drives the final nail in the coffin, seals our fate under sin, and sends us off to the grave. Thank you very much, Paul. His argument is effective, his argument is conclusive, and his argument is true. And now with verse 20, or with verse 18, his argument is complete. What began clear back in chapter 1 has now come to its final conclusion in chapter 3, verse 18. So this leaves us this morning with two more verses, which is a summary statement about the relationship between the law and sin from which we draw out three very important doctrines and I'm not afraid to use that word email me and complain (laughs) I can take it in verses 19 through 20 Paul says this now we know that whatever the law says it speaks to those who are under the law So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. These two verses are very important if we want to understand the purpose as well as the effect of Old Testament law in light of New Testament gospel. From it, I believe we can draw out three doctrines that point us to the end of ourselves. It's a good place to be. And also the beginning in Christ. So let me give these to you briefly. First of all, the law speaks to those under law. Paul says that we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Verse 19. The law speaks. It speaks to those who are under law. And who is it that is under law? Simple answer. Everybody. It's not just the Jew. It is Jew and Gentile. And here's why, according to Paul. To the Jew, the law speaks explicitly through the oracles of Moses, Romans 3, 1 through 2, saying, then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the benefit of circumcision, great in every respect? First of all, and here it is, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. The Jews were given the law of Moses, the oracles of Moses, we could say. And so they have an explicit speaking to them of the law. To the Jew, the law speaks explicitly, which means it speaks clearly and in great detail through the written letter of the law handed down from Moses at Mount Sinai. And this is a great privilege for the Jew. And we're thankful to God for it. Because we also have the scriptures because of them. Right? But on the other hand, to the Gentile, the non-Jew, the law also speaks, but it speaks implicitly through the heart. Romans 2, 14 through 15, Paul explains. For when Gentiles, non-Jews, who do not have the law, do instinctively the things of the law... These, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written where? In their hearts. Their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. To the non-Jew, the law of God still speaks, but it speaks implicitly, which means it speaks to a person by instinct through their conscience, having the law written on their heart. For example, I think that it is safe to say 
that for most in our culture, though this is probably waning away very quickly, but we would recognize that going out and committing murder in broad daylight would be wrong for us to do. Okay, let's just assume that we all agree on that, okay? For the Jew, they can point to the law written in the Ten Commandments and hear it speak explicitly this truth. You shall not commit murder. For the non-Jew, they can point to the law written on their heart and hear their conscience speak implicitly this truth. So that whether through the oracles of Moses or the conscience of the heart, Paul argues that all are under the law. Okay? I'll just... You agree with that. (laughs) So this is the first doctrine that these verses teaches us about the law and its relationship with sin. That all are under law and all are under sin. Okay, that's our first doctrine. Second of all, as the law speaks, the law closes everyone's mouth. Paul says that the law speaks so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. When the law of God speaks, when it is revealed, then the mouth of man is silent. The prophets say, Habakkuk 2.20, The Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth be silent before him. Or again in Zechariah 2.13, Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. The Lord has the ability, through the means of his law, to shut the mouth of every human being. I have heard the angry protests of unbelievers who say that if there is a God, and if there is a day of judgment, then they indeed will be ready to give God a piece of their mind. When the day of the Lord comes, they are looking forward to really letting God have it. They are going to tell him in no uncertain terms just how awful he is. They are going to tell him how weak and how foolish he is. They are going to tell him how he messed up the world. They are going to tell him how wrong he is about life. And on and on it goes. But I am afraid that they are going to be sadly disappointed, to state it lightly. The reality is that at the holy revelation of God on the day of judgment... All mouths will be silent before him. Revelation 8.1, we won't go there for the sake of time. As God is revealed in the full display of his righteousness and his holiness, the law itself testifying to this, heaven and earth and sinner alike will tremble before him as they try to flee from him with no place found for their escape. Every mouth will be closed. Every sinner will be silent. And all the world will become accountable as the book of the law is brought to bear on the works of mankind. The atheist may be preparing their speech now, but on that day they will be, in fact, speechless. So whether we receive the conviction of the law now, or in the hardness of our heart, we receive it on judgment day, the result is just the same. The law closes every mouth and brings all the world into accountability to God Almighty. This is the second point of doctrine that Paul points out concerning the relationship between law and our sin. Third and finally, Paul tells us that the law brings the knowledge of sin. He says this in verse 20, that through the law comes what? 
the knowledge of sin. Which means that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified before the sight of God. At the end of the day, what is it that we conclude from all that Paul has said about the law and sin? Well, I think it's just simply this. That the law in and of itself can't save anybody. The philosophy of try harder will not get you there. James, I believe it's James, says that if you stumble in one part of the law, you're guilty of violating the whole shebang. That's my word, not James's. It's not in the Greek. (laughs) The best that the law can do is to condemn the sinner by exposing our sin. And I'll take the rabbit trail. This is why it is such a tragedy that we don't have the Ten Commandments posted in our government places and in our schools. Not because the law, the Ten Commandments, will all of a sudden make our nation a Christian nation, But no, it has the effect of humbling us, of drawing out our evil, exposing our sin. That's the tragedy of losing the Ten Commandments in our courthouses, as we no longer recognize sin. And if we don't recognize sin, we can't repent. And if we can't repent, then we're lost. So the law is, in a sense, helpful. But also, in a sense, it's not. It's like this, right? A person is sick, so they go to the doctor... And the doctor assesses the sick person, runs tests, makes evaluations, comes to an educated conclusion. And the conclusion that the doctor comes to is that they have a disease which is fatal. The doctor knows of no known cure. It is a terminal illness. The doctor is able to diagnose it but he is not able to heal it. In the same way, so is the law. It is able to give us the precise diagnosis of our diseased heart, but it is completely unable to heal us of that disease. Through the law, Paul says, comes the knowledge of our sin... And that's where the law stops. It cannot fix us. It cannot justify us. For as he says by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified before the Lord. The law is not able to save us from our sin. It is only able to give us the knowledge of our sin. And that's the third and final doctrine about sin, which is necessary for us to understand. And don't worry, I'm not going to stop there. (laughs) We will conclude with gospel hope. Because as we close out verse 20, we come to the great turning point of Romans. Up until now, Paul has been delivering the decree of heaven against The ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who suppresses the truth and unrighteousness as the law is brought to bear against it and exposes it for what it is. The result being that every mouth is closed and all the world becomes accountable to the Lord. And if the voice of scripture concluded there, we would be in very serious trouble. The only possible outlook on life would be that of the theme of Ecclesiastes, which says, vanity of vanities, all of life is emptiness and a chasing after the wind. 
We may as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But fortunately, the Bible doesn't conclude with verse 20. Instead, it goes on to explain that the death sentence of the law serving to bring us to the end of ourselves is actually only the beginning of our redemption in Christ. And what I mean is this. As the law serves like a doctor to identify our fatal disease, but yet is unable to heal us of that disease, we ask the question, well, why was the law given? Merely to condemn us? Or does God have a greater purpose? The answer is that God has a greater purpose. And to give you a scriptural answer, we turn to the great book of Galatians and conclude with a point of hope. I hope. (laughs) Galatians 3.22 says, But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Right? Very important verse. The first part of it is essentially the same thing that Paul has just said in Romans. The scripture, referring to the law here, has shut up everyone under sin. Right? Same thing that Paul said. That the law has closed the mouth of everyone. But with that, he also says more here in verse 22, and that more brings us hope. He says, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So there's a process. The law comes, closes our mouth because it exposes our sin for what it is, humbles us, brings us to the end of ourselves before the Lord, but yet it goes further. It opens the door to the promise of Jesus Christ that by faith in Him, there is hopeful redemption. There is, in fact, justification in Christ. And so how does this secondary effect of the law work? Galatians 3.24 says, Therefore the law has become our tutor. Why? To lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Just as the law is like a doctor pointing out our fatal disease, so too is the law like a tutor teaching us and leading us to Christ. So how is the law like a tutor? Well, let me ask you these questions. Has the law convicted you of your sin? Right? Do we need to go back to James? (laughs) Has the law brought you to the end of yourself? Has the law humbled you under the mighty hand of God? Has the law closed your mouth of self-righteousness before the Lord? Has the law exposed you and left you naked and powerless before the ever-watching eye of the Almighty? Has the law decreed your death sentence because of your thoughts, because of your words, because of your actions? If so, then praise the Lord. Why? Because it means that the law has become your tutor, your instructor, your schoolmaster, and you are now ready to receive salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. The righteous law has shut up everyone under sin so that it may become our tutor instructing us to place our faith and trust in Christ, who is our only hope. Try harder to keep the Ten Commandments will not get you there. But it will point you to Christ. Hmm. One last drink as I close. (laughs) And let me ask another question. Has the law revealed to you the reality that sin is stealing your life 
that it is killing your soul, that it is destroying your relationships, then this is the day of the Lord's mercy for you. Turn to the good shepherd and by faith in him receive abundant life. Final verses of the day, John 10, 10, and 11. The thief, we often interpret that as the devil, but nowhere in that passage is the devil referenced. It just simply says the thief. So we can certainly call the devil a thief, but we can certainly also call sin a thief. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I came so that they may have life. Oh, not just any life, but abundant life. Life abundantly, above and beyond. Not just surviving from Monday, Tuesday to Wednesday. Oh, but thriving, living to the glory of God with the power and the passion of the Holy Spirit driving us every inch of the way. Taking life and squeezing it for what it's worth to the glory of God. Abundant life. And then he qualifies everything by saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus says, I have laid down my life so that you may have life, and not just any life, but abundant life. Hmm. So today, if the law has convicted you, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Confess Christ as your Lord. Trust and believe in him for life. And he'll give it. It's the promise of God. Amen. Amen. Worship team, would you please come? This morning, we give you a few moments to reflect on the word this morning. And we intentionally give you this time every week to be able to spend time before the Lord and confess any sin. And having confessed the sin by faith, believing that Christ is also going to heal you of that sin. And then when you're ready, you can come up and get your communion elements and we will celebrate Christ together. Father, we thank you so much for your love towards us. God, we celebrate that very truth of James that says every good gift and every perfect thing comes down from above, coming from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation, there is no shifting of shadow. God, you love us and that is not a lie. God, you have sent your Son to die for us so that we may live for you. That is not a lie. There is no variation. There is no shifting shadow in that truth. So Father, today I pray for any in here who may be stuck in the philosophy of try harder. God, that you would break them out of it. Humble them under the mighty hand of God. Close their mouth with the law so that the law may become their tutor leading them to Christ and freedom. And I pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.